Hey there, Fiber Junkies. Welcome back to The Color Cauldron. I'm Johanna, the owner and dyer behind Potion Yarns and host of this podcast. Whether you're a brand new viewer or you've been coming since the very beginning, thank you for tuning in today and checking out what's going on in my little corner of the world in Kansas City, Missouri. If you guys were here for the video last week, if you saw my video from last week, I mentioned that I was leaving my dance team of 10 years um, to focus more on my business and my family. So um, I've talked about it a little bit on the podcast, but basically if you're a new viewer and you're not aware, um, I am a swing dancer. I love dancing swing. It's so much fun. I've been doing it for 10 years and it really is super fulfilling for me. I've kind of been leading the team for about four or five years now um, with the help of some other people on the team, of course. And so yeah, recently it just has gotten to be too much, um, especially having a leadership role on the team. Um, we meet every week and perform all over, sometimes more than once a week. And when you're running the team and you're actually responsible for coming up with the choreography, planning practices, taking care of the bank account and the advertising and the bookings and the contracts and everything else, it's just a lot. So I am delegating those things out to other people. And uh, for the past two months, I have been slowly transitioning out of that and gradually moving more and more of my tasks over to other people. And actually I still have a few that I'm working on transitioning on the admin side, the boring unfun side that I'm working on. But um, this Tuesday, just two days ago, was my last dance practice. Um, I am planning to go back this summer and do a couple workshops that I'm gonna teach for the team um, on a specific dance style, which I'm really, really looking forward to. But for the most part, I am basically stepping out of that for now. I really hope that someday my, my life settles down a little bit and I'm able to find a way to work it back in. Um, but for now, I'm stepping away. However, that doesn't mean that I'm done with dance. I will still be dancing socially and with my husband and hopefully with friends um, in and around KC. And I'm actually hoping that now that I'm off the team that I will have a little bit more time to perhaps uh, plan some trips to some competitions and workshop weekends out, out of town as well as here in Kansas City. So. Thank you guys for your support on that. I know several of you had mentioned that you totally understood the struggle that it takes sometimes to let go of something that you really care about or, or relationships or hobbies or whatever um, you choose to spend your time with in order to grow your business. And it is so exciting that Potion Yarns is growing so fast that now I'm having to actually cut things out to enable it to get bigger. Um, so thank you guys so much for your support and helping me to live my dream and helping me to grow this this tiny little yarn company. Um, I mean, really, it's only been 18 months, you guys. Like, I can't believe that it's going this fast. So, so yeah, I am um, celebrating and consoling myself with a really pretty cupcake. Uh, my team at my last practice two nights ago surprised me with um, a special farewell dance and some really delicious cupcakes uh, that the boyfriend of one of the guys on our team made. And they're so good. He put red wine in red velvet cupcakes and then made a champagne like buttercream type frosting. These are these things are boozy and they're delicious and they're amazing. And they specifically picked a white and orange swirl frosting that looked like a rose because they said it reminded them of my hair because it was super bright orange and now it's fading into like peachy coral because um, I'm trying to let it fade out before I redo it again. Um, so yeah personalized cupcakes that are almost too pretty to eat, but they're so good, I keep eating them anyways. Another fun thing about today, today is May 10th, 2018, and on this day, seven years ago, my husband proposed to me through dance. It was amazing. So, <laughs> um, when we were dating and he decided to propose, he tricked me very thoughtfully um, into a proposal video <laughs> because we had been talking about how we were wanting to advance in our personal dance. We were on the Swingster team at the time, dancing with them and getting a lot of help there, but we were, we were feeling like um, the team had to focus as a whole on what everybody needed to work on and what we were specifically trying to accomplish for routines and performances. And he and I were wanting to progress our personal dance levels in several different styles, not just the ones we were focusing on for the team. So we had talked about wanting to do that and maybe taking some private lessons or doing some more workshops. And um, in the meantime, we decided that we would film ourselves dancing because we had learned through our team that sometimes you do something and you think it feels great and then you film yourself doing it and you're like, oh, did not realize I was like throwing my arm out really weird there or did not realize I make the goof this weird goofy face every time I do an underarm turn. <laughs> so we decided that we would go ahead and film ourselves so that we could improve our dancing. 
kind of critique ourselves. So he set up um, a time after work one day, and I actually remember it was a Tuesday, and he set up a Tuesday after work to meet me at this building that our, at the time we were going to a church downtown um, or in Midtown. And our church had a building right next to it that they owned and they would rent it out for like wedding receptions and special events and banquets. Um, but it was like this, it's this really cool old, um, I don't know what they call it, but basically there was an old uh, streetcar um, in Kansas City back in the day and there was this big oval building that the streetcars would like come into this building like as a station to kind of be redirected back on their track um, and then it got turned into just a cool oval building with these big huge tall windows and a hardwood floor and huge high ceilings it's really great for like like ballroom uh, it's like a small ballroom kind of a thing um, and so he convinced the church to let us use that for free just because nobody was going to rent it on a Tuesday. Um, and we had some friends who were on staff at the church, so we managed to convince them that we would use it just for our video. And we'd just get in, film our video for like an hour, and then be gone and wouldn't hurt anything. Um, and so he got there early, and he had created a playlist for us and set up a camera and like marked off space on the floor so we'd be in frame of the camera. And I get there, and you know, he had all this all set up, and we start dancing, and I'm just thinking, this is whatever, and I'm super busy thinking about work and I remember it was like crazy hot for early May and they had not turned on the air conditioning and we forgot to even think to ask them to do that so we're dancing in an unair conditioned building in May and it was stiflingly hot and so then I'm getting a little cranky and I remember being real sweaty and putting my hair up and all this stuff and um so we danced a few songs and uh, he told me that he was you know had a, it marked off on the floor so we have to stay within the space so we don't go out of frame and I'm like great awesome and then the song came on, on the playlist, that um, was Love Story by Taylor Swift. And that was a song that had, I think it had just come out recently at the time. This was in 2011. Um, it wasn't super old. And we had really enjoyed that song and talked about how that reminded us of our dating relationship. Because um, when we were first dating, we were super young in high school. And um, his parents were not super thrilled that we were dating. So there was a lot of like awkwardness with, um, you know, being sheltered little Christian kids that aren't allowed to spend any alone time together and trying to like date but like not date and honor his parents wishes but like be together and <laughs> it was it was an interesting Romeo and Juliet story but with a much better ending than that <laughs> and so anyways we it was kind of a special song and so it came on and I was like oh our song and he was like yeah I, I, I really like it and I remember thinking at the time this is like, I love this song and this is really sweet, but this is not the greatest song to be practicing our West Coast technique, but oh well, you know, if he, if there's a bad one after this, I'll just tell him to switch it to a better one or something. <laughs> I was so clueless. And so we start dancing and there's a part in the song um, about two thirds of the way through where it talks about um, he knelt to the ground and pulled out a ring and we'd been dancing and right at that part in the song he did this super suave move where he did this cool move and at the end of it went down onto one knee and i just thought oh that's a really cool move way to style like musically wise that fits perfectly with the music well done breck but i kept dancing thinking that he would get up and like he was just going down and then was going to get up there's multiple moves you can do on your knee you know in swing dance so i thought it was part of the dance so i keep dancing and then i realize he's not getting up he's not getting up and <laughs> and um then he like actually pull started talking and I was like wait what's happening and then it clicked in my head and I was like no 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 this isn't really happening right and then I was like oh my god it's happening um because we've been together by that point for almost seven years it was like six and a half years or something at that point um and so yeah, he kept talking and then he pulled out the ring right at the part in the music where it says he pulled out a ring and it was so perfect and it was beautiful and we cried and it was amazing. So yes, today is my anniversary of getting engaged to my soulmate and love of my life and Mr. Potion Yarns who helps us out a lot. He does all of my uh, logo design. He helps with these videos sometimes. Um, he's He's been instrumental in getting my YouTube up and running and is very great with helping me with branding and um, just the way that I'm presenting my website and things like that. So even though I do a lot of the actual work, he comes along and gives me really great consultations and he also does a lot of the actual work with editing these videos when he's in town and can do it. So thank you to Breck for helping me and happy anniversary to us. So 
let's get into the actual podcast now that we've had a nice long chat about what's going on in my life that doesn't relate to knitting or only mildly relates to knitting. So last week on the podcast, I showed some socks that I had cast on using one of my abstract hand painted sock blanks. And it was the Kiss Me sock blank, which I showed last week. As you can see, I've made a lot of progress. It is almost half gone. The halfway point is right around somewhere in the middle of this big lip here. Um, so I'm almost halfway through my sock blank and I'm doing two at a time socks because this is a double knit sock blank. So you can pull two strands of yarn off at a time. And I just finished the heel turns, which I hadn't done last week when I showed them to you guys. So I wanted to show you my heel turns of my socks. So as you can see, I'm doing toe up socks. I cast on two at a time from the toe up and then I increased and then have been knitting the foot and then I am doing the Fish Lips Kiss Heel, which I've mentioned multiple times on the podcast. Um, and you can find that pattern on Ravelry. It's literally a dollar and it's just a technique. Basically, she describes it, explains it, and gives you photos and videos you can watch um, all for a dollar. So that's a great deal. But I've done this for several of my socks lately. Actually, most of my socks lately have had the Fish Lips Kiss Heel. And I think it's just because it's so easy and quick and it's really nice for toe up socks. I am wanting to expand though and try some other heel treatments because I feel like most of the cool heel treatments I've tried before are for cuff down. And while I do knit socks that way, I really do enjoy doing the toe up when I can because I just like how I can knit till I run out of yarn. And I just like, it seems like it's easier for me. Um, although one thing that I hear from people that prefer the toe up a lot is that they, they like it that way because they hate kitchen or stitch and grafting those toes closed at the end. And I'm kind of weird, you guys. I actually love Kitchener Stitch. I think it's amazing. And it's so cool how you can use it for so many different things, like um, on shoulder seams and grafting like two halves of a shawl if you knit from one end, or, or a scarf, say. You knit from one end of the scarf up to the middle and then put those on a holder, knit the other end up so they're identical. If you have like a lace pattern or a cable pattern and you want them to match on both ends of the scarf, you knit one half to the middle, then cast on again, knit the other half to the middle, and then you graft them with Kitchener Stitch or another type of grafting um, into the middle and you get a double-ended scarf, like both ends match. So there's so many cool ways to use it like that. And I love it and I don't find it that difficult to remember like I did in the very beginning But I just look it up a couple times and then now I never have to look it up I just and the thing is I don't have a trick to help you remember it <laughs> I know some people will make like a little rhyme to help themselves remember it and I never did that I don't know for some reason it just stuck in my head after a few times of looking it up and I just Memorized it. I don't know. Sorry. I know that's not very helpful, but um, I know there's a lot of people out there who hate Kitchener stitch So toe up socks are for you then because there is no Kitchener involved in it But I am loving how this is knitting up and as you can see if you look at the sock blank that I'm knitting from We talked about sock blanks a lot last week, which was hopefully really helpful for you guys I know it was fun for me to do but if you can see in addition to this big guy in the middle I had all these little smaller lips around the edges and there's a big um, section of all the same color and then all these fun little speckles around the edges and so as you're knitting that can create pooling where you get lots and lots of stitches in the same color for several rows that can create little pools and as you can see on my socks it did create some pooling now I personally love it because since it's on socks it was not a large enough section um, where it was just solid red. If you can see really closely, there's like a row of red broken up by a row of white and speckles, broken up by some red and black, broken up by more red. So it goes back and forth between the red and the speckled background. And so that kind of keeps it from being too pooling. And I actually really love the way it travels across the sock right here. I think it's really kind of cool. So I decided to leave it in. And um, if you're interested in how to break that up so it doesn't do that, Go back to my video last week and I gave you a couple ideas on how you could avoid that happening if that's something that's a concern. Or you can just pay attention to what you're buying in the sock blank and maybe don't buy one that has big sections of color like this on the lips because it's that's what's gonna happen most likely. Um, okay, but I just wanted to show you how that was coming out because I think it's looking so fun. I love the heels back here. You can see all the fun little speckles creating these really unique 
socks. And as you can see, these are double knit. So the idea was they create an almost identical sock. But the great thing about hand painted sock blanks, especially with the techniques that I use, is you're never going to have exactly identical. And I like that because they definitely look like they're a pair, right? They look like they go together. But the red is in slightly different spots, the purple's in slightly different spots, it kind of moves differently within each sock. So there is still a little bit of variation. If you are one of those incredibly OCD people that, and no harm if you are, but if you're one of those people who likes things to be exactly symmetrical, my mom is kind of that way. She tends to like things exactly duplicated, exactly symmetrical and balanced, and it bugs her if one of her socks is like a little bit off than the other one. Um, it doesn't bother me as long as they're close and they look like a pair and I even have some that look wildly different from a single knit sock blank and I don't care I just wear them together because I think they're fun But if you're somebody who wants them to be perfectly symmetrical You might want to pay a little bit more attention to where you cast on or you might just want to not try sock blanks and end up getting like self striping or something where they're very perfectly measured out so that they look exactly symmetrical but I wanted to show you guys that because I know I've had a ton of questions from people about how these sock blanks that I'm painting knit up, what they look like um, in process as well as when they're finished and I just wanted to show you some of that. So let's get on to talking a little bit more about how we're going to read our indie dyed yarn to get the most out of it for our projects. And when I say read, I'm talking about looking at the skein and getting a feel for how that is going to knit up or crochet up in a project. Now, um, it's probably, I mean, it's sure, for some people it's possible, but to me, it seems like an impossible task. Um, and for most of us, I think it is impossible for us to 100% exactly figure out what it's going to look like. And um, so it, this isn't an exact science, but we can at least get a feel for it, get an idea, get the mood for it, and choose stitch patterns that are going to enhance the yarn rather than detract from the yarn and vice versa. So when I go to choose a pattern, and we talked about this a little bit a few weeks ago, but one of the things that I consider when I'm choosing a pattern is sometimes I choose a yarn I want to use or showcase, and then I go to find a pattern that will fit that yarn. That's what I did with my Swamp Witch sweater that I showed on the podcast last week, which was almost finished and needed buttons put on. Um, and I've shown that several times on the podcast, but if you remember from a few videos ago, I was swatching for a cardigan pattern, I had dyed up this new colorway that was a heavy speckle, a real earthy, mossy, brownish green background with lots and lots of bright speckles, and I wanted to create a cardigan out of it, and so I had chosen a pattern specifically for it, and I started to knit a swatch because the back of the cardigan had a very detailed cable panel that ran right up the middle of the back, and as I knit that cable panel as my swatch, I discovered that the yarn that I was using was absolutely awful for that pattern because the pattern had such intricate tiny little cables that the speckles were just too overwhelming and it completely obscured the stitch pattern and you couldn't really tell what was happening. So it actually made the yarn color look worse and it completely obscured the pattern. So it wasn't worth all that effort. So thank God I did the swatch because then I just ripped it out and um, I found a much simpler stockinette and ribbed pattern that really showcased the yarn beautifully and is gonna be a really great, versatile, easy basic. And then that other pattern, I am going to go out and choose a yarn specifically to go with that at some point in the future. Um, still haven't found it, but working on it. Um, because I want to really show off that great cable pattern and I want to get something that isn't going to overwhelm it and will support the cables without detracting from it. So as you go through, you're gonna find that there are certain patterns that really look a lot better with um, very, very busy crazy yarns and then there's other patterns that are going to look a lot better with more subtle yarns so today I wanted to show you some swatches that I knit kind of showing off one of my hand dyed yarns and giving you kind of a feel for it so to start with the yarn that I am using oh and this got a little messy it's got a little messy in my knitting bag but the yarn that I am using is my Victorian pinup colorway and here is the end of a rather large cake this is the very end of it um, but as you can see, it has some lavender purples, some rich cranberry burgundy colors, some very, very light, soft, mauvey pinks and browns, kind of a brownish gray, and then little hints of like a really warm black. So uh, this is a variegated colorway. If you are unsure of what I mean by that, go check out my video from two weeks ago. We talked about tonals, variegated speckles, hand paints, and the difference between different um, terms to categorize our yarns. But um, if I hold this really close, hopefully you can see this, it goes along the strand and it fades 
from color to color and they're short color runs. It's not very long. I think this run of black here, that is my run of black right there. I'm guessing that is maybe about six inches tops. Um, and a lot of these have even shorter runs. Um, and like here on the lavender, there, it's lavender, but it fades from lavender into like a kind of brownish beigey gray into like a pink along the strand. So that's one way if you're not sure and you are able, like if you already purchased the yarn and you either have it caked up or can pull a little out of the skein, you can just hold it up and go down and look at how the color progresses and say, oh, it's really, really lavender here and then it like fades out almost to white here and then it comes in a little bit more lavender here and then there's a splash of black here and then there's a splash of brown here and then there's some like solid black pretty much and then some really like charcoaly tones and you can figure it out from that. But just looking at it, you can kind of tell this is this is a variegated skein. There's big sections of color and they're fairly dramatically different. Um, I knit a pair of socks, which I haven't shown on the podcast yet, but I mentioned. Um, these are just the charade socks, which I'll put a link to that pattern below. It's a free pattern on Ravelry. So cute. I absolutely loved this pattern. Very, very easy. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. I believe this is a cuff down sock, if I remember right. But uh, this is the colorway Victorian pinup knit up. And as you can see, it had, pardon my gross nails, by the way, I've been dying and they're all broken and nasty. But as you can see, it doesn't exactly stripe. It's not exactly self-striping, um, but close to it because of the gauge of my sock. Now, if this was on a larger gauge project, that would look differently. We'll talk about that in another video coming up. I'm working on that for a future video, but see on the bottom where it's stocking at, you can see that while the color doesn't go all the way across, it almost has a slightly stripey effect. It's definitely sections of color that then turn into other sections as opposed to a semi-solid or a tonal yarn. These are some socks I knit up in my Beauty School Dropout colorway, which is a tonal. And as you can see, if you look at the foot of this one, it's all shades of pink. Some purpley pinks, some reddish pinks, some pinky pinks, but it's all shades of pink and it fades from very light to very dark and back again. So that is how you know that's a semi-solid and it's going to support busier patterns like this lace. This is a fairly intricate lace pattern that I did um, on these socks that looks like little hearts. And this yarn colorway is perfect for supporting it. It still has enough movement between the light and the dark panels that it looks exciting. But when you look at it from a distance, you just register it as pink sock, not different colors. And then if you get up close, you can see, oh, there's super baby ballerina light pink. And then there's kind of a purpley pink. And then there's kind of a smoky pink. And then there's a bright, bright pink. Barbie pink. So it has lots of different colorways. Um, if I tried to do that pattern in the Victorian pinup, it would look awful, frankly, which is why I chose a very simple slip stitch pattern, very, very, very simple, um, and some simple ribbing to create this sock. It gives it enough texture and interest that it really helps to break up the lines created in this uh, colorway and it gives it some really nice texture, but it doesn't overwhelm. When you look at it, it looks very, very nice and attractive, at least it does to me. I love it. So I'm really happy with how my socks came out. I think they're beautiful, and I had not ever knit with this colorway before. I've been dyeing it for almost a year, and I had never knit with it. So I'm really excited that I got to knit it up, and actually it is currently out of stock in my shop, but guess what I just dyed yesterday? Some Victorian pinup! And um, so, Look for that in the future. If you're in the Kansas City area in June, I have a trunk show and maker fair coming up and it will probably be making an appearance there. So hopefully you can get there and if there's any left after those events, they'll be going in the shop. But I wanted to show you some swatches I knit with that. Now, whenever you have a busy yarn, I feel like the default mode for everybody when they get a wildly variegated skein of yarn is to think, well, I guess I've got another stockinette or garter stitch project in my future. I know that is with me. When in doubt, stockinette, reverse stockinette, and garter stitch are always easy choices and always safe. So frequently I will use some of my busiest colorways with very simple stitches like stockinette, garter, maybe a slip stitch like those socks, but even that's getting a little fancy. So um, those are the easy, safe choices. When in doubt, go stockinette or garter or reverse stockinette. However, there's so much more you can do with it. And I would like to just offer some ideas about what not to do and what to do when you get wildly variegated yarn. 
So I knit up, I took the leftovers from my socks of that same skein of Victorian pinup and I knitted up a couple swatches that I wanted to show you. Since we've already seen on here that ribbing looks awesome, slip stitch simple patterns look awesome, and stockinette looks awesome right here, we've already seen how that looks up. Um, now when I say slip stitches, I'm talking about something like this where you're like knitting around and then you knit a couple, slip a stitch, knit a couple, slip a stitch, and then on the next round, knit even so that you're creating elongated stitches or crossing stitches over like in this one we did a slip stitch that you crossed over something very simple slip stitches are an awesome way to add a little bit of texture and kind of break up patches of color if you get pooling or self striping yarns that you kind of want to shift a little bit you don't want it to be just solid stripes or a big pool of color slip stitches are great i highly recommend getting a stitch dictionary um, because they will help you to come up with really good ideas. But first we're gonna look at some swatches. So the first one I did was a cable panel out of the Victorian pinup. Now this is not just a boring basic cable. This is actually a really cool cable, traveling cable that I found in one of my stitch pattern books. And basically, as you can see, you have a reverse stockinette background. So all the pearl bumps out here. And then in the middle, you have these um, stockinette columns basically that you create a traveling stitch that kind of makes this fun little almost hourglass shape and it just keeps traveling up like that. It's just a panel of stitches. Now if this were done in a solid or a semi-solid, you'd be able to see it a lot better because it wouldn't be such a busy colorway and you would actually be able to see the cable traveling. But as you can see right here, this is really too strong of a colorway for this cable pattern. It really gets lost. It's so busy that unless you're like right up close to it, you're not gonna be able to see it really. As soon as you start to pull it away, it, it's like your eyes are having trouble adjusting and it's like, what is even going on there? What's happening? So you can see even from this far away, it's pretty hard to see. Now imagine this on a sweater 20 feet away and you're gonna be like giving people epilepsy seizures or something. This is just too, too busy. Um, and that's, of course, that's at worst. At best, they just won't see your pattern. And why would you wanna waste all that time doing all these intricate traveling stitches if nobody can even see it? So really you can see in this scenario, this pattern and this yarn really aren't a match made in heaven. They really don't belong together. This, both of them will be happier finding other partners. So don't force them to play nice. This is why we swatch and we say, oh, that's not gonna look great on my sweater. I guess I will rip that out and try again and I will choose a different yarn for my pattern or I will go find a different pattern for my yarn, one or the other. And there's no wrong answer. You can use either one as your starting point. It's whatever you wanna do. Let's try it on lace and see. I'm holding up a little piece of white paper behind it so you can see the lace a little bit better. But this is a fairly intricate lace panel, not nearly as intricate as I could have gone, but it's pretty intricate. And as you can see, um, this is better than the cable in my opinion. This could work. This really could work. I could be okay with this lace panel, depending on what type of design it was in. However, it still seems like it's a little busy to me. If I really want the lace to take center stage, I might want to choose a different yarn. Now, because this one doesn't have any specific patterns to me, I think this could work just fine, especially what I see this as is like a stockinette, three quarter sleeve top with like a scoop neck or a boat neck, something very simple and elegant, very fitted across the boobs. And then right underneath the, your bust line having an A-line shape, kind of like a Regency um, gown from Jane Austen's time or something, um, or like the Hold Sway cardigan I did, that kind of shape, but just um, an A-line drop to the hips that's lace. So lace down here, stockinette on the top. Don't you think that would be pretty? Oh, guys, I should start designing. If I had time, I would freaking do it, but I don't have time and I hate math, so that's not happening. But um, I think that would be lovely in that type of pattern with some stockinette or garter to balance it. It would also be great on the bottom of a shawl. So like maybe like an asymmetric shawl where it's got some garter and or, <clears throat> excuse me, garter and or stockinette at the top. And then at the bottom, a nice big wide panel of this kind of lace would be fine. So this one is a personal preference in my opinion. Some people are gonna look at this and be like, that is gorgeous, I'm doing it, happening right now. Other people are gonna look at it and be like, are you kidding me, that is way too busy. Phoebe, Phoebe loves to climb on my table when I'm filming the podcast. Okay, so here's one of the things I personally use as a barometer when choosing lace 
Um, if it's busy like this, I will generally try to choose a much more simple eyelet lace um, or something that doesn't have a very strong, distinct pattern within the lace. And what I mean by that is you'll, you'll look up stitch dictionary sometimes and you will see patterns where the lace creates a shape, like the lace creates a leaf shape, right? Or it might look like a leaf or it could look like a cat. I've actually seen Dorothy Reed is a, a not very famous knitter, but contributed just as much as Elizabeth Zimmerman, in my opinion, um, to knitting's history and progression in the 60s and 70s especially, but go look up Dorothy Reed. She has a bunch of really cool stitch patterns that she charted that were her original designs, and she has one that looks like little kittens. Um, and it's really cute, but it's all lace, so it'll be like a stockinette panel, and then she uses eyelet lace to create the outline of a little cat with a cute little tail. Um, super fun. So she did a bunch of those types that are real geometric, strong shapes. Anything like that that's a really strong, geometric, recognizable shape, like an animal, a leaf, a tree, something like that, you would not want to do this in because the yarn is so busy, it will overwhelm the pattern. If you look at this again, see if you can pick out the patterns in here. Are there any distinct patterns? And what do you see in there? Everyone will see something different, but what I see when I look at it is I don't see a distinct shape like, oh, this looks like a butterfly or something like that. I don't see that. Instead, I see almost these little like arches. Okay, I'm gonna have to do it without the, the paper behind, but I see these like swoopy arches here, almost like a little check mark. Um, but that's kind of a very basic general shape. It's not a really strong shape. If I'm trying to pick out like a tree or an, or an animal or something in here, that's just gonna be overwhelmed because honestly, when I look at this, yes, I see the lace, but what comes forward to me is the colorway. So I don't really notice. I have to look very close and very hard to even be able to see where the yarn overs are at because my the first thing I notice and my eye picks up on when I look at it is the color shifts. It just looks like an ele elegant, airy, delicate color shift. Now, if this was done out of my beauty school dropout that I used for these socks, I think you would be able to see, your eye would be drawn more to the yarn overs and the um, decreases that are creating the shifts in the stitch pattern more than the yarn color. So you need to decide when you're looking at lace, is it more important that they see the shapes in my lace or that they see the color in my lace? What is what am I trying to show off? What is the important thing to jump out at people? And the other reason I wanted to show you this is because I wanted to remind you guys, I am the queen of not swatching and not blocking. I am maybe one of the laziest knitters that you will ever meet. Not the laziest, but one of. I do not do anything unless there's a reason. But I've learned over the years that there is an intense reason why we swatch, especially if we're making a garment or if we are using a new yarn in a rather bold colorway. If I am using a new yarn in a bold colorway and or am knitting a garment, I will always create a swatch or almost, I should say almost always because there's always gonna be those times I break the rules and just don't care. But I almost always create a swatch because that's how you're gonna figure out how your yarn behaves. And you can hold up different swatches and see the same yarn behaving different ways, right? This one to me is the most cohesive for this pattern. It just looks like this yarn was made for this pattern. I feel like I designed these socks. It looks like I designed these socks for this yarn, but I didn't. It's just free pattern on Ravelry. And it would look totally different doing that same free pattern in a semi-solid. Go look at the projects page for the charade socks on Ravelry and you will see wildly variegated, brightly speckled, soft subtle speckles, tonals, complete solids from commercial companies. You'll see everything. It's a very popular pattern and it's really good to look through that and get an idea of how it's gonna knit up. Now here's a trick if you're a lazy knitter like me, Ravelry is your best friend because you can go to the pattern page, look at the projects and see the different yarns that people have used to knit up and that should give you a better idea of what you want to see when you knit your socks. So before I knit these, I looked at the projects page and I was specifically, I really wanted to use this colorway. I was actually looking for a pattern for socks just for this colorway. So I went through and looked at several projects and was trying to find a pretty variegated, bold color with rich, deep, bright colors, something that would be similar to what I was using. Oh, hi, baby. Um, 
And I, I found several variegated patterns and that gave me the confidence to say, I'm pretty sure this will look good. So I did not swatch for this. Also, I do not swatch for socks because my feet are a size six in US women's and that is small enough that by the time I, especially if I'm doing toe up, by the time I cast on a toe, knit some increases and get up to about here, I've got a decent enough swatch I can tell whether or not it's gonna happen. And if it's not, I just pull it out. And if it is, hooray. Um, so, and same with cuff down. I just put on like 56 stitches, cast on 56 and then knit a couple inches. And by then I can tell if it's gonna work or not. Socks are the one thing you don't need to swatch for. I mean, you still can for sure, but to me, by the time you put on a swatch and knit it up far enough to tell, you might as well just cast on your sock in the round, knit a couple inches, and then if you have to rip out, you have to rip out, just like with a swatch, you'd have to rip out anyways. So to me, I don't swatch for socks, but that's one of the only things I don't swatch for. So, um, or I shouldn't say that. I actually don't swatch for accessories like shawls. I don't swatch for, the only time I swatch for a shawl is if I'm worried about colors and it's a large cast on. But if it's one of those shawls where you cast on like a garter tab and it just kind of grows organically, I just keep going as where I'm at. Um, sometimes I'll swatch for brioche shawls because I don't like to rip out brioche, especially in a large project like a, a shawl. But in general, when in doubt, swatch. Also, this is why you should consider putting your, um, oh, Phoebe, I didn't weave in my ends and she's finding them irresistible. This is also why you should put um, pictures of your projects with the yarn on Ravelry and make sure that you link to the designer and the pattern page. Um, but if you can, try to enter your yarns when you buy indie dyed yarns especially, try to enter your yarns on Ravelry in the stash or at least record them when you knit with it. Um, like I haven't ma made a project page, but I am going to go make a project page once I get some photos of these. And I'm going to put them on Ravelry and make sure that I put in there that this is Potion Yarns Banshee Fingering, which is my 100% Superwash Merino 4-ply. And um, I'm going to make sure that I add the colorway Victorian pinup because I want people to be able to go on Ravelry and search that yarn and say, oh, hey, look, there's Victorian pinup. Oh, that's what it looks like. Oh, hey, look, there's a project with it knitted up. Let's see how it knits up. So I hope that that gave you a little bit more information about how to take a look at your um, hand dyed yarns and the importance of swatching before you choose yarn for your project or before you choose a project for your yarn. Like I said, it really doesn't matter. Um, with this one, I chose the pattern to go with the so or with the um, yarn because I really wanted to use this particular colorway. And sometimes I have a pattern like the I Am Groot cardigan that I swatched for with Swamp Witch and Swamp Witch was definitely not the right choice. So I Am Groot is still sitting around in my Ravelry queue waiting to be knit and I just need to find the perfect yarn. So now I'm on the search for a good yarn. I'm also on the search for a good project, um, which reminds me, one last thing. I am leaving for Ireland a week from Monday, which I can't believe. <laughs> I'm so excited. I cannot wait for my two week vacation. I am so stoked. I am sad that uh, I will have to close down the shop. So if you're looking for yarn, I definitely recommend you get in before May 20th because that, that's the date that I will be taking my shop into vacation mode on the website. So there won't be anything up for um, purchase for about a week or so. And then after that, it'll just be dyed to order options that will be coming later. Um, so please, please, please keep that in mind. And um, make your purchases now and then there will be some in the shop the first part of June but it will be pretty small because I'm getting ready for a trunk show and maker fair in the middle of June so it will be the end of June before we have any bigger shop updates but there are definitely some really exciting things in there right now before I go out of town on the 20th so make sure that you go ahead and check that out and um oh yes the thing I was going to say is I would really love your help and suggestions on how to choose projects to knit in Ireland. I feel like a lot of stress, <clears throat> excuse me, because I feel like I really want to take my knitting because we are going to be renting a car and driving around Ireland. So there's going to be many hours in the car and there's going to be many hours where we're just like on a boat going somewhere or like hanging out in the back while somebody else is driving or at night before we go to bed. I always like to do a couple rows before sleeping to kind of help me de-stress and disconnect from a screen <laughs> and uh, just get some good sleep. So I want to take some knitting, but I am a little bit limited because we're trying to keep our luggage very small because of all the traveling and renting a car. And um, I don't want to have a lot of bulk and I tend to be an overpacker. And so if I'm gone for like three days for a weekend, I will pack like four projects. It's ridiculous. So I'm trying to figure out what I can take. I'm thinking a new pair of socks, 
um, that I can keep in my purse that's really, really small and portable for like going to the museum and stuff. And then I'm thinking, I really wanna do a sweater, but I don't want it to be crazy intricate. I really wanna do a Fair Isle sweater, but I feel like that's like crazy pants taking that many um, different colorways and skeins of yarn and everything else. So I'm really leaning towards a simpler cardigan or possibly just a really big like three color shawl or something. But I don't know. So if you have a suggestion, drop it in the comments below. Let me know what you would take on a two-week vacation to Ireland when you need to conserve space. All right, I hope you guys have a great week and enjoyed working with your indie dyed yarn, but it is time to cast off. Love you.